Cyborgs, Rap und freier Wille? Politik und Populismus, Spiritualität und Ethik, Tod und Teufel. Ein Podcast mit Menschen, die was zu sagen haben. Hier ist Erleuchtung garantiert. Ich bin Dorothea Lüttekens, Religionswissenschaftlerin an der Universität Zürich. Heute geht es ausnahmsweise nun gleich weiter auf Englisch, weil ich mit meiner britischen Kollegin Beth Singler hier zusammensitze. Beth ist Professorin für Digital Religion. Noch spezifischer formuliert ist ihr Forschungsfokus im Bereich der künstlichen Intelligenz. Beth, you are the only professor at our faculty in Zurich who lives with how many robots? Uh, I haven't counted them recently, but I think maybe 12, 15. Okay, think, yeah. so there are 12, 15 robots uh, in your office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess you, are, you yourself are not a robot, are you? As far as I know. Okay. Uh, there may be some tests we should run just to double check. But uh, no, I'm, I'm working on the presumption that I'm as, as human as you are. Okay, we will see. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are the only one who manages to visit five fun parks from Disney World to SeaWorld in Florida in six days. And survive again. How many <laughs> roller coasters? Uh, again, I think maybe we went on about six. Uh, the last one really was the absolute limit for me and I stopped going on them but uh, yeah that was a I'm a person who's very afraid of heights I don't like going fast but my son does so I went on them with him so obviously you are a very brave person <laughs> oh very stupid <laughs> might be another way to think of it no I, I I had to do this for the entertainment of my son who is the light of my life Oh, okay. So that sounds pretty religious already. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, what you experienced in Florida, was that also interesting for you as a scholar or was it only a, yeah, being mm -hmm. a mother? Oh, no, absolutely. There's a lot of existing academic work on the popular religion that is expressed when people get very engaged with fan culture, with theme parks, Disney in particular. I know there's some excellent work available mm -hmm. on people's understanding of Disney as as sort of taking a, a, a religious role in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm not someone who's been a lot to those sorts of theme parks, but you could see amongst the visitors that, yes, yeah, some people have prepared way in advance. They wear family t-shirts saying it's the, let's say, the Smith family mm -hmm. visit to Disney and there's Smith dad, Smith mom, and they've all got different themed t-shirts. There's, there's the almost ceremonial wearing of the Mickey Mouse headband with the ears, mm -hmm. lots and lots of variations on that. Um, the way people go, year after year. It sort of falls into categories of things we might talk about as implicit religion or vernacular religion. Uh, there's various different interpretations, but absolutely, it's, it's hard not to have the anthropological eye when you mm -hmm. go to such fascinating places of culture and society and yeah. communal activity. Yeah. yeah, you are an anthropologist mm -hmm. by training and mm -hmm. a scholar of the study of religion. And I, that sounds that that could be a very a pretty interesting course. Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I want to explore There's One of the, the things I want to work on while I'm here is that overlap into popular culture of religious ideas and how also popular culture can filter into religious innovation. A lot of my previous research was on specific new religious movements and the new age movement. Mm -hmm. And there's still a wealth of material we can explore in how people create their religious identities, both on and offline, um, and how science fiction, fantasy, horror sort of imbues those religious identities with particular forms. Can you give us an example? Yeah, so I've worked previously on Jediism, which uh, if you're aware in the UK, we have a... a, a every Perhaps you have to explain what that yes. is. Yes, okay. So if you've come across the Star Wars films, mm -hmm. within the Star Wars universe, there are individuals who have access to something called the Force, mm -hmm. and they are usually trained by an existing Jedi master in the use of the Force. And they, I mean, the, the, the mind of George Lucas, who created Star Wars, he was very inspired by the monastic system by Buddhism and ideas of holism. And he sort of put these ideas into the conception of the Jedi and Jediism. And then I've looked at how 
some people in the real world have taken those ideas and see them as inspiring for their religious and spiritual activities. Uh, so they don't necessarily, and I've spoken to Jedi, they don't generally believe that the world so they, of Star they Wars... So they talk about themselves as Jedis. Yes, yes. But they don't believe that the world of Star Wars is real and yes. the actions of Darth Vader and everything actually mm -hmm. happened. But they see it as an inspiration to their own religious creativity. Um so in the UK, we have a, a large census every 10 years, and they ask questions about religious affiliation. And in 2001 was the first time people started writing in Jedi or Jedi Master or Jedi Knight. And I think there was something like 360,000 people in the UK oh. uh, wrote down Jedi. 10 years later, it was about 176,000. It's, it's difficult to, to understand. So they don't believe in this world but at the same time mm. they practice they believe in the concept of the force the sort of holistic interpretation of the universe that george lucas yes. describes but they don't think that george lucas is a prophet and he saw a far off universe of rea real things that were mm -hmm. happening it's more that they recognize star wars as a story but an inspirational story for how they want to live as jedi um so that it's in It's what some people, some sociologists of religion would call an invented religion, inspired by fiction, consciously created by people who know it's fiction, but see some truth in the story that they're, they're interested in. So could one compare that with uh, some Jews or Christians or some Muslims who think, or, or Hindus who think the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Bible is full of inspiring narratives mm -hmm. without believing that these kind of stories really happened. Yes, I mean, I guess the difference is in how far, how long ago the stories were written. We have a, we have an assumption that things that are older are in some ways more true. Mm -hmm. And they recognize, obviously, the first Star Wars film came out in the 1970s. We're not talking a very long time ago. But it's just that creative people, creative humans like George Lucas or to some people's mind, the creators of the Bible, have come up with wisdom that mm -hmm. is worth recognizing, even if the source is described as fiction in mm -hmm. some ways, or not, not literal if we're talking about the Bible or the Bhagavad Gita. So that interpretation, yeah, I think there's definitely a parallel there. It's just because it's so much newer, people find it a little bit more surprising, perhaps, that pe people are willing sometimes to call themselves Jedi or other, other science fiction-inspired mm -hmm. religious movements. Fascinating. Um, we are sitting together in the nunscript and where the name comes from, I still couldn't clarify. So, but anyway, we are sitting in a room that doesn't look like AI at all. <laughs> <laughs> Rather the opposite, quite old and cozy. And I wondered, I don't know whether you see AI as something being cozy at all, but um, definitely... The name of this room, the nun script, is funny, and AI can definitely be fun. Mm -hmm. So one can discover that in your office, and I asked you to bring some robots <laughs> from your robot office museum, <laughs> as I like to call it. <laughs> can you tell me a little bit more about them? I mean, yeah. I see them here on the table, yes. and you can see them, but <laughs> yeah, the podcast uh, no. people who... So the first thing to say is they are not literal robots. People get very disappointed that I don't have, you know, a Roomba in my room or an actual Asimo, but I have... A what in your room? A, a Roomba, the, um, the robotic vacuum mm -hmm. cleaner, as an example of a, a contemporary robot. I have instead a collection of toys that represent particular robots. Now, some of them are fictional robots and some of them are actual robots. So I mentioned Asimo, uh, again... Podcast listeners can't see this, but I have a small uh, keychain of Asimo, who is a Japanese robot that I actually visited at the Tokyo Museum of Science and Emerging Technology, where he does, uh, I think, two shows a day, comes out, does a little performance for the families, goes away again. He's a very advanced humanoid robot in terms of his ability to balance and to do different actions. And then the other ones I've brought are ones that are more from science fiction. Uh, I have a, a K2SO toy from 
Star Wars. I'm obviously <laughs> interested in Star Wars. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Data from Star Trek Next Generation, which was probably the first robot I was really aware of as a child and one that has a lot of influence on some of our philosophical conversations about what it means to be a person because Lieutenant Commander Data was an android who served on the Star Trek Enterprise and always was on a quest to become more human. He's sort of the Pinocchio character of the series. And then I have a robot scientist who's running a diagnostic on a small plastic robot, just to show also there's the human robot interaction mm -hmm. that goes on. So he's my only human in my robot army, but he is a scientist who's trying to figure out what's wrong with his robot. Yeah, you already mentioned Japan with yes. regard to, to this little cute guy. Mm. And... Um, I liked a comment from you about the misleading concept of West and East. Yes. Um, you spoke about that some time ago. I don't know whether we talked about that mm. during lunchtime mm -hmm. or it was on one of your podcast sessions. I don't know. But the idea of the so-called Western world being not so affine to robots and AI as the so-called Eastern world. So I really, mm. really appreciate it that you do not follow these stereotypes of a Western and Eastern culture. And yeah, you, you are already nodding. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is one of my bugbears. And, and there are many other academics who look at the perception and reception of AI who agree that this is just a very simplistic binary that comes out of uh, biases in, in the so-called, again, quotation marks, Western view of what happened with the Enlightenment, this idea that after the Enlightenment in, in the so-called West, we became more rational, but everyone everywhere else was still doing their irrational things. And it's sort of also a, a very bad techno-orientalism that says people in the so-called East, they have a heritage of Shinto and Buddhism, and that makes them less reasonable when they think about AI. It makes them more likely to see them as persons when they're not. And it just uh, it, it comes down to a discussion of how much animism there is in a culture. And the assumption is... Okay, Western Shinto cultures is quite often associated with anim yes. animism, but and Christianity is not. The blindness is not seeing where we have yeah. animism existing in Christianity, particularly in vernacular Christianity, that actually... Give us an example. I totally yeah. agree, but... Yeah. Um, well, I spent a lot of time looking at sort of the overlaps of Christianity and the New Age movement and perceptions of angels in particular, mm -hmm. and some of the ways in which, yes, you have your doctrinal interpretation of angels in Christianity, but the vernacular interpretation comes much closer to animistic interpretations of spirits in the world and their ability to do particular things. So going to, to doing field work amongst people who are both Christian and New Age interested, you know, there'd be discussion of asking my angels to do particular mm -hmm. things for me. One person I met was late for a meeting and she said, well, I was finding it very hard to find a parking space. So I asked my angel to help me mm -hmm. and then a parking space arose. So there is still that long heritage in so-called Western cultures of seeing the world as imbued with spirits, be they angels, kami in, in Japanese culture or otherwise. It's just that we have a we have a meta-narrative of post-enlightenment rationality that says we don't do the same things that other cultures do. And actually there's a lot more overlaps right. than people are willing to admit. And when it comes to AI and robots, it's a particular instance where you can see that animistic culture coming out again in the West or so-called West. Can you explain where this link is between dealing with robots mm. and animistic mm. concepts or practices? Because of our tendency to anthropomorphize things that are not human-like, we see lots of uh, examples of when people have interacted with robots or AI and see them as being imbued with animistic spirit, that they have agency on their own, that they have a have a persona of their own. It doesn't take very much for us to take that step. So even the most simple chatbots, even bots on Twitter that really display very simplistic language, still people engage with them and, and construe them as having spirit and, and agency within them. And that's only enhanced by the more sophisticated large language models like ChatGPT. Um, very specific case recently with uh, Lambda, which was a, a Google chatbot that Blake Lemoyne was working on. He claimed 
that it had already achieved consciousness, even though he was an engineer who'd been working on it and knew it was designed and created specifically to be very convincing in its linguistic ability. But he took that one step further and, and saw the spirit inside it. So we're seeing a very quick slippage in our engagement with AI and robots to seeing it, them already having consciousness. And sometimes that consciousness as a term overlaps with things like spirit and agency and soul even. And that sounds scary for many people in the in the so-called West, or yeah. at least yeah, in Switzerland. It's a it's a concern. Um, it depends where you're coming from with your metaphysical viewpoint as well. There's some very interesting research done by an organization called Theos in the UK, more specifically about religious interpretations, mm -hmm. asking in surveys questions like, could a robot have a soul? And then also finding about people's religious affiliation. So do Christians think it's more likely that a robot could have a soul or do you And think... And what's the answer? Um, actually, the, the statistics are very low on most religions and most even non-religious people as well saying, no, actually, they think that a robot could never have a soul. I don't have the statistics to hand, but yeah. it's it's mostly negative. But still, they, they say they have a kind of agency or a spirit or personality. Yeah. It's very easy for people to, because we, we have a language bias. When we mm -hmm. engage with both human and non-human others, we... Generally, this is a huge generalization, we judge their capability for intelligence by how they communicate. Mm -hmm. So if I talk to you and I'm very non-communicative, you make, may, may make some assumptions about how smart I am. But if I'm a, a chatbot and I'm very good at holding mm -hmm. a conversation with you, we find that to be intelligence. It's, it's the Turing test, basically. The Turing test was never a test for uh, asserting consciousness. It was just that Alan Turing, the, the British computer expert, expert and sort of founding father of artificial intelligence in some ways, he said, as long as it can pass for intelligent, we'll consider it intelligent. So as long as it, it speaks convincingly, we will then see it as intelligent. And that's, there's a danger there. Put, put to one side the metaphysical questions for a moment. It makes people convinced they're dealing with a single agent instead of the product of a corporation that's making decisions on their behalf about what that product does. So the more we see AI and robots as individual agents, the less we see corporations making decisions about what they're going to be used for and what kind mm -hmm. of potential harms there might be as well. So there's a big ethical societal issue in the personification of AI. Now it's difficult for me this, to decide um, what point I yeah, kind of pick up in our conversations. So I'd like to come back to this ethical question mm -hmm. because I know you are very aware of ethical issues with regard to avatars, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you already mentioned um, JetPods or JetGPT. And I wondered, perhaps you could explain for our listeners mm -hmm. what that is. Yeah. And perhaps you can tell me a little bit more about what in your eyes, I mean, in how far in your eyes that will change our perception of ourselves mm -hmm. and culture and yeah. meaning making mm -hmm. and all these things. Uh, Because, I mean, it's it's a huge discussion. It's a massive uh, discussion at the moment. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of angles to it. So basically, chat GPT is a, a large language model. So Computer scientists, AI technologists, take a large corpus of language, probably scraped from the internet, from, from centuries of books, and input that as data to a model that then calculates the connections between words. That's really all it is, is probabilistic interpretations of if this word, then probably this word after. It's very complex. It's many layers of that kind of calculation. But that's really all it's doing is making inferences based on the words that it's been given, drawing on its data set. Mm -hmm. So when you go to ChatGPT on OpenAI's website, and anyone can do this, which is partly why it's so uh, popular and exciting right now, because it's more accessible than a lot of earlier uh, generative AI chatbots, You can put in a question and it's assessing those words and deducing what are the most logical words to come after it based on its large, immensely large data set. And it's been trained on this data set over and over again. 
it has limitations. Um, people are now, you know, exploring some of those limitations and finding that actually when you determine what's the most likely word to come next, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's true. So for instance, um, I asked chat GPT a, a little while ago, who is Beth Singler? I'm curious, who, who does this chatbot think I am based on its data set? And it came back with a response that if you knew I was interested in AI and this was my field would be completely reasonable. It said, uh, Beth Singler is working on a steering committee on uh, the medical uses of AI at the Turing <laughs> Institute. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, yes, I have done things with the Turing Institute, but I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. So it's finding reasonable responses that aren't necessarily accurate. It's limited in its scope of what the data provides to it. And it has limitations in answering particular questions as well. Now, the, the larger question about what's the impact of this on society, on meaning making and on our understanding of what it means to be human as well, is that to my mind, this adds another layer between us and our search for information. So the, the pursuit of chat GPT is partially about providing answers to questions online. So mm -hmm. Google is also implementing a version of chat GPT that if you do a search on Google now, mm -hmm. instead of a list of websites based yes. on CEO, you get an answer yeah. formulated mm -hmm. by this chatbot. And that might not necessarily be accurate. That might be like, who is Beth Singler might be an inaccurate, but reasonable sounding answer. Yeah. Um, I have, yeah, as I said before, I've already heard comments from you that you see very relevant ethical questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously with regard to that, mm -hmm. uh, but coming up again, uh, coming up too with regard to a metaverse and the existence of avatars. Yes. And again, perhaps you can tell us a little bit very shortly <laughs> what is meant by the term metaverse right. <laughs> and what is an avatar okay and um i was i was very curious whether you could give me an example of an ethical challenge mm -hmm. with regard to avatars okay so the metaverse is a term from science fiction from neil stevenson's work in the 90s and it basically refers to a collective virtual reality space with maybe subdomains different particular themed areas but just broadly a virtual reality space that we could go to and we could work there we could be entertained there we could find romance there all sorts of options but i need a computer to go there um yes you'd probably need some sort of virtual reality equipment goggles uh haptic suits eventually it's it's been imagined by science fiction mm -hmm. many many different times but the term specifically comes from neil stevenson and a lot of corporations are very interested in this as a potential space for new economies that we will go we will not only pay to go there, but we also pay to exist there in various different ways and run businesses there. Um, the kinds of ethical questions that come up around specifically being an avatar in that space is how much then that space is controlled by the people who are providing it. Uh, we had the same sort of questions with social media, but they're perhaps amplified when people are willing to live in virtual spaces, as, as is speculated. Mm -hmm. There's ethical questions around data as well. You would need... Um, ambient and artificial intelligence within that space to be able to provide the experience people yeah. want. Um, and that also requires scraping data from people's behaviors, mm -hmm. their interests, their likes. Uh, there's concerns about things like religious freedom. Um, oh, yeah, that, that's interesting. Yes. So, and how far is that a problem? At the moment, not very much because the metaverse is still a kind of hypothetical construct. Uh, there's And are there not several metaverses? Yes, yeah, we have competing corporations who are trying to develop the metaverse. Okay. There's also what you might call pseudo metaverses, uh, online games that already fulfill some of that potential. Mm -hmm. So Roblox for kids yeah. is very popular. My son plays a lot, but it's, it's again, it's a virtual space where people can come together and build things together. But yes, if you're, if you're of a particular religious inclination, there should be concerns about how much you are able to be your own religious identity in these spaces when there's corporate filters, freedom of speech might be could tailed on particular nations who have a particular view of particular religions mm -hmm. um freedom of identity is going to be a really big concern for people mm. but i mean it's my choice to enter a metaverse mm -hmm. or not yes but you would have to sign up to the terms and conditions of the metaverse yeah also as we've seen with social media there's a social pressure to be in particular spaces there's uh, enhancement of career opportunities i oh. i 
think wow. with with some spaces it's been almost impossible not mm -hmm. to be on there in the modern society if you're in particular roles yeah. and jobs the metaverse might be like that to another degree uh, our time is nearly over but mm -hmm. perhaps you could tell me a little bit about what you're at the moment fascinated especially mm -hmm. in your field of artificial intelligence and religion religion spirituality yeah. Uh, so one particular thing, I'm working on larger projects, but one particular thing I'm very interested in at the moment, I'm going to write a paper and do a keynote uh, speech at a conference on, is whether, um, well, this sort of fundamental question I keep being asked in interviews about, could AI create religion? So it's going back to the roots of what that question really means. And? Ha well, I mean, I would say answers. why not? Why I, not? Yeah, so, that's one particular interpretation. I think it's good to unpack what we mean by create religion. So it's going back to my work on new religious movements, mm -hmm. how they emerge versus more metaphysical interpretations about revelation. Could AI be involved in revelation? Do people believe that? I'm coming at it again from an anthropological angle mm -hmm. to see what is the current discourse around AI's role in creation of religion, but also its connection to our more theistic interpretations of the world? Does, does AI have a place for people in that process? And just again, can, talking can you about- explain that a little bit? So some, some theologians are exploring the idea that AI as a part of the overall creation of God is actually capable of some of the same things as humans. So that in that sense, yes, absolutely, by that deduction, AI could be just as responsible for, for performing revelation as humans mm -hmm. could. I find that fascinating as a view. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, everywhere, um, but that's one particular approach. Or you can think about the role of generative AI like ChatGPT in creating texts. Could mm -hmm. we see, it's, it's based on a data set of existing texts, but could we see it creating completely original texts that seem closer to a revelation for some people than others? But I mean, completely original texts, mm -hmm. Neither, as far as we know, from a historical point of view, neither um, yeah, scriptures like the Quran or the Bible, the Hebrew Bible or mm -hmm. the New Testament are, or the Bhagavad Gita again, mm -hmm. are they they didn't came out of the space i mean well yeah again it it depends on people's interpretation about revelation and what that means so i'm trying to okay, un yeah, unpack I, all those elements yeah, yeah. to understand what people yeah. mean when they ask that question could ai create religion and again like i say from an anthropological perspective yeah. there's lots of varieties of interpretation of that and i think that's really interesting and a, a part of the current conversation mm -hmm. with generative ai yeah Okay, so now time is really over. <laughs> I can see that Andy uh, tell, tries to tell me that. Um, finally, Beth, you are committed to learning German. Now, we, mm. we spoke English, but you are able to speak a little bit of German uh -huh. already. Do you have some favorite German or Swiss German words? I, I like hearing uh, the repetition of genau. As is, is like kind of power language, it's sort of a, a punctuation in people's sentences. I hear that quite often when I'm walking around. Can you repeat that? Oh, well, my pronunciation would completely tear. Genau, genau, like, okay. Genau. Genau. There you see, my pronunciation is terrible. But that is a kind of, from an ethnographic perspective, the mm -hmm. way people punctuate and formulate their sentences is quite interesting. Genau. 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 <laughs> genau. I Is will it practice saying it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, genau. Beth, it was very fascinating, very interesting. But I mean, I knew that before because we know each other already a little bit. And mm -hmm. every time we talk to each other, I, have, I come back with fascinating and new ideas and new questions. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that won't be the last podcast with you. And it won't definitely won't be the last um, conversation. Right. Thank you very much us. for the invitation to speak with you. Ja, yeah, thank you being here in Zurich. Thank you. Ja, das war ein Podcast der Theologischen Fakultät der Universität Zürich. Ich danke mal wieder an die Gredig für die für die technische Begleitung und der Podcast Schmiede und wir fangen tatsächlich an mit einem Instagram Account Dank Charlotte Decker, die uns auf den Gedanken gebracht hat und wir freuen uns, wenn Sie uns da folgen. Wir freuen uns, wenn Sie uns weiter zuhören und wir sind spätestens wieder da in zwei Wochen am Freitag. Musik